Okay. Just start, Roger? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, so welcome to the next session, everyone. And we're delighted to have Roger Penrose, who's going to talk about why current string theory cannot resolve the gravitational singularity issue. Thank you very much. No, I'm uh, happy to give this talk. I should explain that it's not restricted to string theory. That is to say, I don't think any theory which one could call a quantum gravity theory can resolve. In the normal terms, we use that the idea of a quantization of something can resolve the singularity problem. So it's not specific to string theory. I, I want to make that point. The first picture here is the take, one taken from my paper and which was published in 19, uh, whatever it was, <laughs> 65, uh, which seems to have got me a Nobel Prize, which shows the article was to show that in a general case where you have gravitational collapse with a certain criterion for when collapse has sort of passed the point of no return, which is the existence of trapped surface, and if the negative, if the density of energy never becomes negative, you're looking at classical physics and you're looking at the evolution from a non compact Cauchy surface, you have to have singularities. So that was the argument there. The argument was, as you can see, uh, to show that you don't, that you get singularities in the future. This is a collapsing material uh, and it gets to a point where there's no escape without having negative en energies or something like that. Um, and uh, that was the, the theorem I was, this was in 64, I think I gave a talk in London and it was repeated in Cambridge where Stephen Hawking was there and I talked to him about the techniques I was using. He developed these techniques specifically to talk about cosmology and particularly the, the Big Bang and the idea again was, I, you see what I showed was that singularities were generic. You don't have to assume symmetry or anything like that in the local gravitational collapse. And what Hawking developed these ideas to show that for a cosmology, use generalizing the technique somewhat, introducing ingenious ideas like the Cauchy horizon, which I think was one of the most important ones, that you, you if you have a collapsing universe, again, with the sort of criteria that you don't get negative, looking at classical physics, negative energies, um, now, that I remember being rather puzzled by this because particularly after I had a, a brief, very brief discussion with Jim Peebles, because I knew there are all sorts of different kinds of singularities you can have and the cosmologists never studied them. They only looked at this one, which is basically the Friedman Robertson Walker with cosmological constant model. The acceleration at the top, you see that's the where we, we now see this acceleration taking place, um, which can be explained by a positive cosmological constant. At the back, I've indicated that I'm not really trying to prejudice the issue as to whether the universe is spatially closed or not. It might go on and on and on, or it might not. The arguments apply to both cases, whether it's closed or whether it's not. Um, now, the issue always puzzled me is that we don't see all these complicated solutions that can occur, certainly nothing like the uh, Oppenheimer Schneider collapse of a collapse to a black hole, uh, anything like that. And in fact, in a generic collapse, this is sort of turning my picture upside down, but not introducing perturbations so that you could have locally, local regions which collapse faster than others or more dense than others. So they produce the singularity sooner in a certain sense and you will get one incredible mess at the end. Perhaps like the sort of uh, model that Belinsky, Lifshitz and Kalatnikov cons considered following the mistake that was discovered in the original paper by uh, Lifshitz and Kalatnikov, which I think Belinsky found. Um, also the model due to Charlie Misner for uh, type nine, Bianchi type nines, you also get this very, very complicated kind of situation which is nothing like what we have in the observed Big Bang. Now, what we see in the observed Big Bang is much not like the try and reverse. You see this, if you imagine time going backwards, I could should say you could put the inflaton field if you like. I'm not going to talk about inflation. It doesn't help at all. It doesn't make much difference at all to this picture. And it doesn't say why a generic situation like this is, couldn't happen. And you can do sort of rough calculations considering that these are lots and lots of black holes or white holes, it doesn't matter. The entropy uh, considered as a, you look at the 
sort of face space of all possibilities and take the logarithm and give, that gives you a value for the entropy. And all I'm using is the Bekenstein Hawking formula, which applies to the entropy in black holes, but it would work just as well in the opposite direction. And so this is an extremely unlikely situation. That is to say, what's, uh, sorry, that's not unlikely, that's the likely situation. What's unlikely is something like this, what we actually have, where you have a very, very uniform initial state. As Jim Peebles pointed out to me, that's what the universe is like, not like all the other possibilities which you could have. So we have this real puzzle. Why do we have this very, very special case? And if you put the Bekenstein-Hawking en entropy into it, we see and look at the numbers of black holes, we see and all sorts of things, something like uh, an unlikeliness of one in 10 to the power, 10 to the power 104, uh, yes, 124, I think, if you put the dark matter in, things like that. So you get an enormously, incredibly special situation and you have to see why it's like that. Just having a theory which gets rid of the singularities. So I used to think for a long time that maybe quantum gravity was a very, very strange theory in that this quantum mechanics was very strange as well as being not just the standard quantum mechanics, but something which was very, very time asymmetrical. I couldn't make much sense of it, but the general sort of feeling was there that some scheme that combines general relativity with quantum mechanics has to involve this extraordinary asymmetry. Otherwise we have a very unlikely situation. That should explain the uh, input inflation. It doesn't really make any difference to this. It only deals with situations which are very, very close to Robinson Walker. If they're very far from it, it doesn't do anything. So uh, let's think of the issue now from the point of view of the second law of thermodynamics, because that's really a key issue. What we're looking at, well, this picture is just a sort of cartoon. The top three pictures, you imagine a gas in a box where initially it's constrained to a smaller box in the corner, you open the box and the gas spreads out. So as time progresses, entropy increases left to right. Now suppose we have in the bottom three pictures, a box of a galactic scale containing many, many stars. And I'm supposing these are sort of randomly distributed. As time progresses, then they will start to clump and you will get eventually black holes. Entropy is still increasing from left to right. Time is increasing from left to right, but it's completely different with regard to the uniformity of the picture. What we actually see in our universe is a combination of top right and bottom left. We see uniformity. We uh, don't see something which is, <clears throat> we see something which is, I should, let's go to the next picture because it's even more striking that it's not just a gas. This is the picture I think from the COBE satellite where they looked at the <clears throat> basically different frequencies. At the bottom you see frequencies increasing, top is the intensity and this curve is a, a Planck curve and the actual observations, I should explain that these error bars on that curve are magnified by a factor of 500. So if you reduce them by a factor of 500, they would hug the curve to within the thickness of the incline, even the last one. So you see that it's a really very powerful indication, not simply that the distribution is pretty uniform, but that the, you, we are looking at a state of thermal equilibrium with regard to matter and radiation. So that's what it's telling us. Of course, the, and the universe is expanding and you have to take that into consideration, but it doesn't really make any difference to this fact that you have a very, very special situation only in gravity. That's the point. The main point is it's only in gravity. You don't see this in our universe, that is. We don't see this in the matter. So what is it that makes the uh, state so special? And I'm arguing that it can't be any ordinary kind of quantum gravity, string theory or what have you, because it doesn't have in it this fundamental uh, um, time asymmetry in what we see. You could imagine a bouncing universe, but it wouldn't do this because the bounce would, in general, yes, it would be very much like the thing I had in the earlier picture here, where it would collapse in a great mess. And then if it's to bounce, you'd come out in a big mess. I mean, how do you lose all those degrees of freedom which are flowing right through the universe in all sorts of complicated ways. I mean, there's not much physics, it's just general ideas here. Now, really, now let me talk about the kind of curvature. This is a, a key point in my point of view. I was arguing, this, this is just a cartoon to show how the do, two different kinds of curvature, the Bauer curvature and the Ritchie curvature affect 
uh, light ray. So if you have an observer over the top of the picture looking back, then the Weyl curvature introduces distortion and the Ricci curvature introduces a contraction or a positive lens, if you like. So we, we, we think things would be magnified um, as you look back, but here you get astigmatism. Um, I should say that this is the trace-free Ricci tense, so the, the, the lambda term doesn't actually affect the light rays anyway, it doesn't do either. But um, you can see there's something very special um, about the absence of the vial curve, which is what we're apparently seeing in the Big Bang. And I used to postulate, well, whatever the theory is, um, it should say that the vial curvature is zero at the Big Bang. So it's a, just a, a hand-waving postulate. Now, the key, th yes, this is the point I want to make here. That's the vial curvature in particular singularity, it's just the Big Bang, goes to zero or when you, as you approach it, whereas in generic singularities, it goes to infinity. Why do we have this extraordinary difference in the way that the vial curvature behaves? And if it's just as an explanation from some sort of quantum gravity theory, I don't see it. It's got to be something of a very different character. Um, I mean, it's well motivated that you should look at quantum gravity to consider what to do with singularities. I can understand that completely. But if it is just a question of quantum gravity, we have a big puzzle. Now, let me continue and look at this from a different point of view, which was a point of view I uh, adopted for many, many years, looking at radiation fields and things like this, is simply to look at a conformal structure. It's very nice because if you have the right kind of geometry, you can represent infinity as a nice boundary. This is hyperbolic plane, the hyperbolic plane in the Beltrami, Poincaré, if you like, originally Beltrami, representation of hyperbolic geometry. And you see these Escher fish, this is an Escher, of course. And it's nice, this particular one, because you see the eyes and the fish are circles and the circles remain exact circles, no matter how close to the edge you get. It is, it's illustrating the striking conformal nature of this squashing at the edge. Um, now, uh, and you can represent infinity, so that's a, a nice way. So can you use this conformal trick? Well, you have to bear in mind space-time is not uh, a, a Euclidean, locally the Euclidean type of geometry, it's locally Lorentzian. Um, so we have to think about the light cones. In fact, what is the metric? The metric in general relativity, it's best to think of it as a, as a time, really, because time is what you direct, directly measure. Here I'm imagining two particles whizzing by through the same point, and here we have the null cone at that point, and we have to add the uh, bowl-shaped and hill-shaped surfaces to represent the, the passage of time with regard to these different particles. And basically all we're doing is combining the two most form famous formulae of 20th century physics, E equals mc squared and E equals h nu, Einstein and Max Planck. We combine the two, energy, Einstein tells you energy and frequency, energy and mass are equivalent, Planck tells you energy and frequency are equivalent, so mass and frequency are equivalent. So if you have a massive particle, it is ultimately a clock. For ordinary particles, it will be enormously high. You have to, you have to scale it down to get atomic or nuclear clocks, but it's basically the same idea. So it's the mass which gives you the scale. If you don't have mass, if you just have photons, it doesn't even see the hills. There is no passage of time with regard to a photon. There's no passage of time if you take classical Maxwell equations. Classical and Maxwell equations are conformally invariant. So they just are interested in the light cones or the null cones, I should say. They don't care about the hills shaped surfaces. So the geometry, it's the causal geometry of space time, if you like. The light cone, the null cone geometry of space time, which is more primitive than the metric in the normal Einstein sense. And this is the way I like to look at things, particularly because infinity can be represented. And this enables us to talk about squashing infinity down. Now that we have a cosmological constant, we know that it becomes space like. There's important work due to Helmut Friedrich, which shows in generic situations, as long as you have massless fields and things like that running around, um, generic situations, you can always do this. And you have a nice squashing down at infinity. And the vial curvature does go to zero at the future boundary. Now, that's nothing unconventional about this. You could also imagine stretching out the Big Bang. And this was rather a good way, a very good way that I, at that time student, I think, Paul Todd, who rather than talking about the vial curvature directly, you just take the same sort of picture, but now the opposite way, you can stretch out the Big Bang to say that it makes a nice smooth conformal boundary. So you could 
the idea is that you could, in principle, extend conformally. You're saying there isn't really anything beyond infinity, or there wasn't really anything before the Big Bang, but nevertheless, it's mathematically very handy to pretend there was, and it makes the equations all work and you can talk about the both ends. Okay, that's not outrageous. What is outrageous is this idea that I introduced about 15 years ago, that you really take it seriously, and you say there was something after the remote, there will be something after the remote future, there was something before the Big Bang, and one was the conformal continuation of the other. So I'm saying that our Big Bang could, yes, indeed, be stretched out to be nice and smooth, but it has to match the remote future of a, com uh, of a conformally squashed previous eon, as I'm calling it, cosmic eon. This actually makes the vowel curvature zero rather than finite, as Paul in his original discussion had. It has to be zero because of Helmut Friedrich and all this and calculations that I did quite early. You can see that the vowel curvature has to go to zero. And that means that because the vowel curvature is a conformal quantity, it has to be zero in the next eon. So you do get a vowel curvature hypothesis from this. You might say it's pretty outrageous. What, what about this cold, rarefied remote future being identified with this extremely hot, dense Big Bang? Well, you see the conformal things do just what you want because the, the, uh, the mass and the energy, the mass uh, uh, and, and the energy go the opposite directions. If I've got it, maybe talking through my head here. <laughs> when you, what I'm trying to say is that when you squash something down, it increases the temperature. If you stretch something out, it reduces the temperature, just because the way that um, <clears throat> energy, momentum, and, and mass and time are, are conjugate to each other. So, so you can imagine that this cooled when you do the stretching, it would cool it down. So maybe the matching isn't so ridiculous. You have to have some hypothesis which tells you, because it isn't just photons in the remote future. We have um, hydrogen. We have probably stray electrons and positrons running around. You have plasma and they might just um, become uh, running around loose. And the hypothesis I introduce is that there is a fade out of mass in the remote future. The Big Bang is easier because you have very, very high temperatures and you could say that the mass becomes irrelevant when the motion becomes very, very high. There is a physical assumption there, but it's a much weaker one to say that the mass uh, fades out in the remote future. But I want to make both assumptions, and this makes the picture at least plausible. Now, for a long time, I gave talks on this, hope, expecting that nobody could prove me wrong so I could talk forever on the subject. But then I began to think of possibly you can have experimental tests. Here's the sort of thing. Here's the crossover. The curve in the middle is supposed to represent the three-dimensional crossover from previous eon to post-eon. And if you have light-like signals, electromagnetic signals, they could get through, or, or gravitational wave signals. So it's, it's a possibility. Um, oh, so I'm going the wrong way. And this was the initial thing I thought about. I suppose you imagine black, supermassive black hole collisions in the previous eon, they would produce signals which we might be able to see. And I have them in the bottom picture. The point I'm making here is that a cluster of galaxies, that would be where these supermassive black holes would mostly take, and they various galaxies in the cluster would run into each other from time to time until eventually there's one super duper one, which basically ultimately swallows the whole cluster. I don't know how much of it, but a good amount, most of the cluster probably gets swallowed by the supermassive black hole. That's where all the mass energy goes. And uh, that um, would be eventually end up, you would see that as a, it would be a point in our sky. And I've indicated a couple of consent, rather faint looking concentric circles representing what the gravitational radiation does. Now, Vahe Gurzajan, who first looked at these things for me, uh, looked at circles which have low variance. That was his way of doing it. And he was looking at triples of circles which had the same center and low variance. To have triples with the same center to get a strong enough signal. And what I found very remarkable, this is from, this is from the Planck data, and the points indicate the centers of triples of circles of low variance. You get, you expect to see them low variance. They're not singled out for the temperature, but by the low variance. And the point I want to make here is that you're very, very crowded in a very strange way, which is not what people expect for the universe. The cosmological principle should tell you that things are fairly, pretty uniform on a very large scale, as we're seeing here. Not true, according to this picture. And clumping also in color. 
Why is, well, you see color, of course, it's very confusing because red means um, low frequency and therefore one normally thinks it's distant red shifted, but it's the, uh, it is, no, no, red shift, the blue ones at the top are red shifted because they're blue. The red ones at the bottom are blue shifted because they're red. That's because of the color coding. The red shifted ones at the top are not so distant because of the way it works. And you have to look at the way the signal comes to us. The nearer ones are the ones which are more blue shifted. Uh, I'm getting it the wrong way around. Which are more red shifted. Yeah, more red, the nearer ones are more red shifted. Sorry? I just say about five minutes left. I've got two minutes. Five. Five. Oh, I see. Okay, fine. Now, I, I really just wanted to point out that the top ones are relatively close in the sense that they're inside our particle horizon. The, the ones at the top, the ones at the bottom right are outside our particle horizon. I think they do probably have an effect on the mass distribution according to the model. And in fact, the cold spot is somewhere around here. And I did wonder whether that might be due to a thinning out of material due to the attractive force of this thing in the previous eon. I don't know, that would be look, nice looked at. There was something interesting about the, the ones up at the top because you might actually see signals. And in fact, there are, very strong clumpings of quasars in, in the sort of neighborhood here. I don't quite know how to make what to make of that, but I should think things like that should be investigated in the future. It would be very interesting. Okay, that was those things. I'm going the wrong way, sorry. The final thing I wanted to say about the other type of signal which we've looked at, there, there are other possible signals we could look for. The other ones are the following. You look at the black hole evaporation. So you have a supermassive black hole formed from some galactic cluster, and you have to wait for, for the really big ones, something like 10 to the 100 years, or Google years, according to Don Page, I think 10 to the 103 years. Anyway, it's an awful long time. And all this radiation, all the content of the mass content of this black hole will go out in this radiation. And maybe there's a little bit comes out from the final pop that it doesn't actually make much difference to what I want to say, because all this radiation, it comes out so late. Let's look at the last picture here. This is a picture from the paper by in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society by myself, Christoph Meisner, Daniel Ann, and Pavel Nirovsky. And it appeared about a year ago in the monthly notices. And we were looking for things which I refer to as hawking points. This is just what I was talking about. The bottom of the picture, I should say halfway down, the picture is a conformal diagram. The top part is just showing you the sort of thing you might see. Bottom part, right below the lowest horizontal line, we have the world line of a supermassive black hole. It doesn't start to radiate away until way, way right up until it's nearly at the crossing point. So the fact that this is all spread out doesn't make much difference because it's so late, it's just a point. So all the energy comes squashing through and you can make an estimate, you can make integrals of, of uh, things outside around it. So, so the fact that there's probably a, effectively a singularity in the cross, everywhere else it will be nice and smooth according to the theory. But here you have something which would come through on the other side, probably smaller than a Planck scale. So it's, you could say, okay, it's not, it's not ordinary classical physics there. It's some kind of quantum gravity going on. Yes, I'm agreeing with that but it doesn't explain the uniformity that you get out here, which is the big puzzle. That's most of the sky. This in 380,000 years spreads out to this part here. This is the what, decoupling or last scattering. It doesn't make much difference where we are. That's when you start to see something. And the spreading out will be to about four degrees across the sky, which is about eight times the, four, the diameter of the full moon. And this would give you a spot something like a Gaussian, which is warmer in the middle, spreading towards the outside. And this is what we seem to see. We see evidence, according to the, the Christoph's analysis, the existence of these spots uh, not being a random effect is confidence level of 99.98%. So they seem to be there. To locate the actual spots, Daniel used a different algorithm, and I'm not sure, quite sure about the confidence there, but you can look at the five strongest points in the Planck data. You look back in the WMAP data and you find they're there also in exactly the same places. 
You also look in the WMAP papers, WMAP data, and you find another point which is almost as strong. Look back in the Planck data, there it is in exactly the same place. So we have six points, which I say are pretty good candidates for being Hawking points. They would certainly affect cosmology to some degree. I mean, there'd be a scattering of these points, not in all everywhere. And, and we wouldn't actually see them because most of them occur within our past light cone. We can only see the ones which are just on the edge. That's us looking back. You can only see them when they're just on the edge. So the fact we only see six strong ones is probably not too surprising. There would be dozens, well, dozens is, is a, how, <laughs> a huge underestimate, an enormous number of these things, according to theory. And they would have an influence. Most, most places would, would follow the sort of Jim Peebles and company evolution, that's fine. But there would be the odd place where you get something funny happening. So I think this is very interesting for people to look at. The thing is, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't seem to be much to do with quantum gravity. I mean, quantum gravity maybe can deal with the future singularities. Maybe it can deal with the Hawking points. I think that would be really a most interesting place where a good theory of quantum gravity might, might play a role and maybe produce something observational. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roger, for the talk. Um, got time for questions. Good. <laughs> Cameron, you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Roger, for a beautiful talk. So I want to make sure I understand. Uh, part of the issue that you're raising about the singularity makes an assumption that any theory of gravity which applies, uses Einstein's theory, will have problems to resolving this issue. Uh, but uh, suppose I, we say that we have a theory for which Einstein's theory breaks down as you approach uh, Big Bang time. And not just by adding one or two terms or whatever, but actually the whole thing breaks down by the emergence of infinitely many light modes with a dual space emerging and all that. Then as far as I can see, there'll be no argument that that kind of theory, if we have such a theory, would not resolve this problem. So given this, I think in the context of string theory, we do see this happening again and again. That is when we approach singular points, namely if you go back to infinitely dense situation or high temperatures, you always get some kind of a dual description and the theory that you're dealing with breaks down due to the emergence of many light modes. So potentially that could resolve the issues that you're, you're mentioning as far as I can see. Well, I don't quite follow the, I mean, I don't know the details of what you're saying, but I, what it would have to do is something very different as you approach the singularities in the future from what happens when you approach the yes, singularities yes. in the past. Yes, exactly. So in other words, it could be that when you're approaching, for example, black hole would be different from the singularity of the Big Bang. Where, where does the difference come in the theory? I mean, you say it's not GR, some other model, is that right? You're right, so for example, if your space is contracting, for, it's very simple, I will give you a very simple model in string theory where we do know what happens. So if you take the universe to be a box, and if you suppose you shrink the three-dimensional torus and you shrink the size, you know that after a while where the size of the box is smaller than the string size, the, the description breaks down. Einstein's theory breaks down. For well, black hole, you don't have that description, that issue at all. So in other words, there's two different situations that we're at. I haven't understood why it's different in one direction of time from the other direction. Of time. No, no, I'm just saying that the, the situation yeah. where the universe is shrinking is very different from the case where you have a black hole collapse in the so context what, of shrinking. How does that difference appear in the mathematics then? Yeah, so this, I'm just explaining it. So if you take a universe oh, given yeah. by a three-dimensional box, so, so you're, you don't think about the black hole that's coming emerging, let's say, for a three-dimensional torus. I'm just saying, if you imagine the universe as a three-dimensional box, we do know a situation where we get a dual description when the universe becomes smaller than a string scale, a certain particular scale. Whereas that's not what happens in the context of black holes. So we do have this asymmetry. And the, so, so yeah. I, I think what you're pointing out is the issue that you would naturally, it's natural to have a dual description taking over. And I think that's, I wholeheartedly agree with that picture that we cannot have a single Einstein's picture covering the old regime. Perhaps we could move to another question. I think Samir was the person who got in there next with a question. Okay, let's have another question. Hi, uh, uh, thanks for that wonderful talk. Uh, I wanted to point out something that we are seeing from string theory, which might have this asymmetry that you were uh, talking about. Okay. So in, in one picture we are finding from string theory, instead of black holes, we get these things called fuzzballs, which are large constructions of strings and brains, you know, which are like the microshades of black holes. And the point is, of course, because the Bekenstein entropy is so large, 
the, pic the picture of the quantum gravity vacuum changes, instead of just having structured the Planck scale, what seems to happen is that you have virtual fluctuations of these black hole microstates of all sizes, because the unlikely fluctuation of a large mass object is canceled by the large entropy of those large mass objects, they exactly cancel. So you have a picture where you have these virtual fluctuations of large things all over, except this is where there is an asymmetry. In an expanding cosmology, the very large virtual fluctuations of the black hole type states haven't had time to form. And you need this to actually reconcile some paradoxes with cosmology, exactly of the kind you were mentioning. So the same thing we need to solve the black hole puzzle, the existence of these virtual black hole states also shows us an asymmetry in cosmology because extended virtual fluctuations uh, cannot form uh, until the uh, light has had time to cross across that distance. Uh, I was just wondering if something like this kind of uh, asymmetry might address what you were asking. Um, well, maybe it would if I understood it better, but I can't quite see, you say fizz, fuzz, fuzzballs or whatever it is, I don't have time to perform. Well, why do you assume that the, the before was of such a special nature? I mean, there's a big assumption which is put into the theory, is that right? You, ha you have to say, you have to wait until some features appear in the model and then they appear. Whereas when you're looking at the, t the collapse situation, you take a different philosophy. I mean, I, it's, it's sort of, it, it sounds to me awfully with these descriptions. And I, I, it, maybe I just don't understand the things you do better, which is probably true because I don't. But I mean, you have to have something where you really treat the time in an asymmetrical way. Because you say, okay, something doesn't have time to form, but then what was it that you decree was before the, the I mean, there has to be a before in order to wait until something happens. No, I agree. I don't understand the initial conditions very well. So, but maybe we can talk offline so other people could also. I yeah. can understand. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. Maybe we could take a question from Edward Witten. Of course. Just a very small comment. The conventional explanation of the simplicity of the Big Bang is simply that we're only seeing back to a post inflationary epoch. <laughs> but that doesn't work, you see. I mean, well, you see, inflation doesn't work either, because in my scheme, I mean, there's one question about the, about the observations, which is a separate issue, because I can't really see how you can have inflation with, with CCC. It just doesn't work, because it, it expands the, direct, the different, the, the conformal gap between the Big Bang and what the, the last scattering, if you like, is enormously stretched. And so you have no, no, uh, no chance of propagating effects from one side to the other. But of course, that's not a, a, a criticism with regard to models which aren't mine. <laughs> with my model, I'm saying that you can't have inflation. But I'm not quite sure I understand your point that you're only looking at post-inflation. You see, you have to have a, some theory which tells you pre-inflation. I mean, that's where the, the quantum gravity be entering anyways. Well, is the point of inflation is that exactly what there was pre-inflation tends to get lost. All those complexities in practice we don't see because we only see the post-inflationary universe. Well, there's a huge number of assumptions involved there. You're saying that inflation is taking place in something which you don't see. I'm not sure I understand the logic of it. Uh, well, for Manu, maybe we could uh, take your question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was wondering, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, quantum gravity uh, saying something about uh, singularities, uh, which are singularities in the sense of geodesic incompleteness uh, and where there are no curvature invariants blowing up? Yes, well, the theory, I mean, I, I think I even mentioned in that original paper, you know, maybe quantum gravity does something. I can't remember what I said exactly. But sure, the idea was floating around very much at that time that the singularities that arise um, may be the way to the way physics answers the question is to say, OK, we have to resort to quantum gravity. And that was a perfectly reasonable point of view, which I myself held for a long time and probably still hold. I think that's true. But what I don't see is how you can talk about the Big Bang in anything like the same way, because it's just different. And if your theory is supposed to get rid of singularities, and if you take, you take 
one of the big reasons for doing quantum gravity, and I quite completely accept it, is to resolve the singularity problem. Now, if you take that viewpoint, then it's a very strange issue when you take it, apply that philosophy to the Big Bang. It just doesn't seem to work because the Big Bang singularity is completely unlike a generic singularity. You set things up already in some way, you know, even to allow inflation, you set things up in such a way to allow that sort of model to be considered seriously. You don't say why uh, is that initial singularity utterly different from those in the future. All I'm saying in the title of the talk that the quantum gravity issue does not, well, it's, it's string specifically, but it's really a more general comment, that the quantum gravity issue does not resolve this, the Big Bang problem. The Big Bang problem is a completely different problem. So if you think of it in the terms of the conformal picture, you get a completely different insight into what the Big Bang is like, what it should be like, what you expect to see, what, what expectations there are from um, theory to observation. And it gives you a lot to work with. Whereas if you're just playing around with quantum gravity ideas, which fine, I'm very supportive of doing it. I don't, I don't want to give that impression that, I, that I'm against it. I'm supportive of it, but I don't quite see how any of these models is going to resolve the Big Bang issue. It's something quite different. And perhaps just one final question from Gabriel Veneziano. Yes, hi, hi Roger. Oh, hi. Very, yeah. very nice talk. Of course, um, you I, I have ideas like before me. <laughs> Go on, yes. I, I have one comment to uh, what uh, Kumrum said and one to what Ed was saying. Uh, to Kumrum, I think indeed uh, you don't have to distinguish crunching or you know, Big Bang singularities. What you see clearly in string theory is that when the curvature exceeds a certain value, which is still much, much smaller than the Planck value, can I, can I there are corrections. You? When you say curvature, do you mean either vile or Ricci curvature? Yes, yes, either. Either Ricci that. or okay. vile, the same, you get corrections. Now, mm -hmm. honestly, we don't know for sure what happens to a space-like singularity like the Big Bang. But we know that there are corrections which become order one much before you reach the Planck scale. Now, the, the second comment uh, is just to perhaps uh, uh, explain better what Ed Witten was saying. I think there is a confusion about what now most cosmologists call the Big Bang and what you were referring to, namely <laughs> okay. uh, the Big Bang, the physical observable Big Bang is defined, if you want, as the end of inflation when the universe reheats and there is no singularity there. Okay, well, that's um, very much consistent with your point of view that you put forward. And, and, and then, of course, this Big Bang has nothing to do with the beginning of time. It's the end of inflation. And then you are perfectly right that still you have to understand how inflation comes about from some initial state. And that could be either your way of thinking, or maybe you just pick up one patch in your very inhomogeneous initial Big Bang, and that small patch becomes itself large, homogeneous, flat, and, and it eventually yeah. becomes our universe. I understand the point of view, but it sounds to me that none of these things really resolve the problem. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, mean I talked to about some of these things in one of my books, I can't remember. I think it was fashion, faith, and fantasy, where you imagine, that, I mean, the point you were making at the end about maybe we're, we're lucky to find out, or lucky is the wrong word, but we find ourselves in a particular place where a huge amount of expansion took place. And that is, is anomalous. And of course, we have to find ourselves where we find ourselves in a place where consciousness can arise on some planet or something like that. And so that singles it out. But I never quite understand why and lots of little ones like this won't, wouldn't be much more likely than one big one. That is to say, okay, we've got our neighborhood, maybe our, pick our galactic cluster, that's good enough. And then why didn't you do something completely different outside that? I mean, th th this is more like this sort of anthropic argument, if you like. Yeah, really so I can't right. quite see why arguments, I think they're, they're okay, they're worth trying, but <laughs> I think, it's not the right track because it's you get yourself one problem after another. 
you have to say why. Maybe we should all maybe we should all thank Roger very much again for a very nice talk. <laughs> okay. And I think it's time to move on. To we don't keep keep discussing on Slack. Yeah. Thank you for your questions, everybody. Thank you. So, Albert, are you there? Yeah. So, hi. 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 Yeah, maybe I can try to share the screen, but probably first, uh, because there's still the previous slide. Oh, no, you can share. You can share right over. It'll. it'll take oh, okay. Do you want me to close my things down somehow? Sure. I think unshare. Did I unshare? Perfect. Yep. Work. Okay, fantastic. So with apologies for the slightly delayed start, uh, we're now very, very happy to have Alva Grassi here, who will tell us about a geometric approach to black hole spectral theory. Okay, so hi everyone. And well, first, 